welcome to the Spot Doctor Podcast. I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. On today's podcast, we're talking about how to balance your hormones and boost your energy. My guest is Dr. Laura Neville. She is a licensed naturopathic physician practicing in Portland, Oregon. Her own personal journey led her here. As a child, she was days away from death at the age of seven when she was diagnosed with an uncommon autoimmune disease. Conventional medicine kept her alive, but it's actually naturopathic medicine that made her well. So now her passion in life is sharing the same information she learned to change her life with others. In her practice, she helps patients suffering from relentless fatigue and to regain their zest for life. Dr. Neville is creator of Energy Explosion. She's also a speaker, writer, and medical consultant. She sees patients locally in Portland, Oregon, and worldwide virtually. In today's interview, Dr. Neville shares practical tips to balance your hormones in ways that will help boost your energy level. Most people are not able to live life to the fullest because their health is not optimal and their energy level is low. So Dr. Neville in this interview shares great health optimizing advice to address the root cause and boost your energy. So please enjoy this interview. Dr. Laura, it's great to have you on my podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. So we're talking about how to boost your energy today. This is a really important topic because we could all use a little extra energy boost, especially at certain times of our lives when we feel like, why is my energy draining? Is it because I'm getting older? Is it, what, what, what's the reason, right? So right. this is something that everybody wants to know. But let's start with your story because you definitely have a personal connection with this. So tell me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I was diagnosed with a life-threatening autoimmune condition when I was seven years old. Um, and I was actually diagnosed with another autoimmune condition around the age of 10. So, you know, as I look back, uh, af you know, um, my entire life and all the work that I've done you know, to, to be healthy and to be really diligent about, about my health. At the end of the day, I realized that my pot of gold was, was about stable energy. Like that was the whole thing that I realized I was after. And then I was seeing my patients come in and tell me, you know, the exact same thing, that they're just really struggling with fatigue. And so it made me realize at the end of the day, no matter what kind of health issues we're all dealing with, you know, this is where, um, you know, a lot of our desire lays. I think energy is something we all want more of. It's a direct reflection of our health, just as you talk about the skin being this, you know, manifestation of what's going on inside our body. I think energy is the very same thing. Um, and I do believe it's the greatest currency that we have in life. You know, we can have these amazing goals. We want the promotion at work. We want to, in, you know, grow our family. We want to travel around the world. We want that house on, on the lake. But um, really, when it comes down to it, if you don't have the energy to do all of that, really, you know, you're just, you're, you have wishes that can't be fulfilled. So, so right. that's, that's why I'm so passionate about that. And, and I intend to, to drive that for people so that they can, you know, manifest their dreams, really. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people think low energy is something that happens later in life. Um, but you experienced it at, at a really young age because of, of your health. And so let's talk about that. Just, I mean, for just a moment, let's talk about what was that like as a child? I mean, a childhood is that time in your life when usually you think kids are so vibrant and full of energy. What was that like for you? My gosh. So I vividly remember being, I must, it must have been seven or just before I was uh, turned seven that I remember being at daycare and um, watching my friends run and play. Like they were running in circles and kind of like, I think they were even throwing sand at each other. <laughs> as silly as that is, we were kids. But I remember sitting on the swings and just watching them. I, these were all of my really good friends and I really wanted to go do the silly stuff that they were doing, you know, but I just sat on the swings and, and thought, are they doing that 
even though they're tired? Are they just ignoring this, this like feeling that, that I have inside of me or do they feel differently than I do? And that was, I think, you know, as a young child, it was, is a hard thing to grasp. Like, you know, I feel differently in my body compared to the next person that we're all not kind of the same thing, but I, I do remember that. So it was, it was really difficult. You know, I think I had that sense from a young age that something was different about the way I was feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that because I think that it is something we all experience and people experience it to different degrees. As adults, we look on social media and we see all these people doing amazing things. They're traveling all over the place and they're exercising and they're climbing mountains and doing all these things. And sometimes it's easy to think, how do they have the energy to do that? I can't, I, how, where am I going to get, I would love to be able to do that. Where am I going to get the energy? And, and the same thing that you experience as a child is, are they just pushing through and making themselves do this? Because that's what I would have to do. Or, I mean, you know, if, if you're, if you, you know, the person is tired, right? Like when you were a child or do they, are they different? Or do they have something that I don't have? I think this happens all the time. I think it's human yeah. nature, whatever age you are. And so I'm really glad we're talking about this to help people identify what, like, let's talk about first, like, what is normal energy? What, what should people expect? And because I'm sure you hear it from your patients too, when you talk to them about after you treat them, how much energy they have, how much more they can do in life. So let's talk about what is, what is, what is fatigue? What does it feel like? And what is just, okay, you didn't get a good night's sleep. So just get more sleep tomorrow night. You'll feel better. And what is, okay, there's something wrong here. Yeah, I think that's such a good question. Um, I do think it differs for each person, like somewhat constitutionally, right? Like someone can be a really extroverted kind of high energy person naturally. And then someone could be more introverted and kind of um, uh, inward in the way they manifest their energy. But I think if you are asking, uh, is this right? do I have, you know, the right amount of energy? There's probably something going on that you could improve upon. Um, you don't have to be, you know, climbing mountains and, and skydiving and, and, you know, um, sleeping three hours a night. Like, I, I think there are people out there that are wired that way. Um, but I think if you have that internal question, you know, like, mm, I feel like, I feel like I could have better energy. And it's not just, you know, one night of sleep, it's a consistent thing that you're noticing in your life. That's where we know we could dig deeper and we can look into all the things that we'll talk about today um, as far as, as how to improve the energy level. All right. Well, I know you have some tips to help with, um, with, the, with boosting energy and some of these help address the root cause. So we'll be talking about that. So, so what would you be, what would you say is the, the first thing that you would recommend people do to help boost their energy? Yeah. I mean, I think the first step to think about is really teaming up with someone that can help you um, test for these things and not guess as to the reason why you're feeling the low energy. You definitely want to rule out kind of some bigger health issues that can show up uh, you know, pretty easily on a standard blood panel, you definitely want to rule out diabetes. You know, high blood sugar levels can leave you feeling really, really tired. Um, things like hypothyroidism or low thyroid function definitely is going to be top of the list for things to consider. Um, there's some less common things, other autoimmune conditions, um, chronic infections can do that, um, but also nutrient depletions like B12 and iron levels. So there's quite a few different things that you want to just get a, get a good objective measurement of, um, and a physician is easily um, qualified to do that. It can help you kind of rule out the bigger issues. Right. And I think particularly, I mean, there are some basic blood work you can do, and there's also some specialty lab testing yeah. you can do. And that's yeah. when it's great to have someone like yourself, like a naturopathic physician right. or functional medicine doctor who is used to those types of tests, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We can always dig deeper and there's, there's a lot out there um, to help you in that way and to help the physician figure out what's going on. So what are some of the symptoms along with fatigue that would be warning signs that testing is a really important idea? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're um, 
dealing with, like I mentioned, chronic infections are going to be a huge one. Um, but brain fog is also another one that usually coincides. I usually I say brain fog. I think most people who experience that know right off the bat what I'm talking about. Like you're just walking around in this, this fog. Um, and then uh, poor digestion. So either um, stools that are not consistent too you know too frequent or infrequent um, those would be other things muscle pain and joint pain are, are other things to consider um, goodness the list goes on I mean it could be anything from head to toe I suppose but but those are the the top ones that come to mind and those can be due to digestive issues nutritional deficiencies mm -hmm. thyroid problems Yes. Sugar. I mean, there are a number of different things that can cause fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I also think that if someone is waking up consistently or throughout the day consistently, it's more of those, the ongoing fatigue that really indicates that you need to look at this. If it's just the every now and then uh, you wake up tired, it might just be um, that you didn't get a good night's sleep, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think a key point is is getting what you think is a good night's sleep and waking up still really exhausted as if you didn't sleep at all. That's a really key indicator that, that something deeper is at hand. Yeah, I know. I've had some patients say, well, I'm just one of those people that needs 10 hours of sleep. Right. And that's kind of a warning sign yeah. to me. If somebody needs because they say, oh, I, I, if I don't get more than eight hours of sleep, then I can't function. Because really most people, if they're getting six to eight mm -hmm. quality right. sleep, right, then, um, and I know this is one of the big tips for you, you know, that you recommend for people is to get sleep. So let's yeah. talk about this. Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the first things I talk to my patients about is really committing to sacred sleep, like protecting your sleep as if it is the only thing, <laughs> you know, that matters. Um, there, are, there are a whole slew of hormones that you can actually um, have, uh, you know, in the right range when you're getting consistent, decent sleep. I think in our culture, we kind of um, disrespect sleep. We think it's, you know, like you can sleep when you're dead or, you know, we, we give a lot of credit to people who are potentially like entrepreneurs or are sleeping three hours a night and they're really driven and we, we like want to give an award for that, right? And, and what we need to remember is that sleep is, is part of human nature. It's so key. It's absolutely key to the way our physiology works. And so there's a hormone called human growth hormone or HGH. And there's a lot of people out there injecting this hormone. It's shown to improve testosterone levels in men. Um, it also helps to help uh, improve weight loss for people. And it seems to really be great at regenerating and repairing tissue. So it's kind of thought of as this wonderful anti-aging hormone. Um, and I like to remind people that you can actually get this hormone for free mm -hmm. um, when you're committing to quality sleep because your body will produce it naturally. So you can uh, cheat, cheat the system there. <laughs> so you don't actually need to get the injection if you're getting a good night's sleep, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Another hormone that comes up so often with healthy sleep is melatonin. So um, a lot of people out there have probably heard of melatonin. It's a hormone that our body naturally produces and it tends to rise as we're approaching sleep time and then um, decreases when we wake up first thing in the morning. And so oftentimes I think we have um, incorrect levels of melatonin or too little melatonin because we're around a lot of artificial lighting. Um, this was actually something that was studied by the 2017 Nobel Prize winners. They really um, pulled in the information to understand how, how important light is into our circadian rhythm and how well we're sleeping. And so it's something to really, really be cognizant about you know, maybe dimming the lights in your household as, as nighttime approaches. 
Um, one of my favorites is wearing uh, those blue light blocking glasses. If you guys have seen those, they're pretty inexpensive. You can get them on Amazon. Um, but those can help to block what we think of as the spectrum that seems to be the most impactful to melatonin levels. When we are exposed to blue light, the melatonin levels we see drops quite drastically. And that can have a huge impact in how well you're sleeping. Um, and then on the flip side, when you wake up in the morning, getting bright sunlight on your face is, is also very important. It seems to kind of set this timer in the brain to say, okay, 14, 16 hours from now, I'm going to start raising the melatonin levels. I'm going to start helping this body relax and, and get ready for sleep. So that one's also really important. So I was just thinking about something. I know that a lot of people will pull dark, heavy blinds over their windows to at night to help keep the outside light, maybe they're, if you know, especially if you live in a city and there's a street light or something like that, to keep that from coming in. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that's a good idea to help you fall asleep. But then I was just wondering, as you were saying that, does that then make it harder for people to wake up in the morning? Because they're, they're blocking out the natural light now that's coming in in the morning. Yeah, I mean, I think naturally we were in the past waking up with the sun, right? So there's something to be said for that. It does look like the um, research from the Nobel Prize winners found that there was this magic window of 30 minutes of light um, approaching the face or the head within an hour of waking. So it does look okay. You know, that can really help block out the light at night. And I think as long as people are just, you know, you know, spread those windows wide open as soon as you get up, at least within, um, you know, that hour time frame and get as much as possible. They seem to do pretty well. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I, have, a, I have a puppy now and uh, I've got to take her out all the time. And so yeah. first thing in the morning, I'm outside and right now there's snow on the ground. So there's like so much light in my face. First yeah. thing I get out in the morning. So maybe that's actually a good thing. I can look a at good it that thing, way. Yeah. You're probably sleeping really well if it wasn't for getting up, you know, with the puppy every night. <laughs> well, she does sleep through the night at this point, so that's good. Oh, good, 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 good. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So anything else to sleep? Other hormones or anything else that yeah. we need to know about sleep? Yeah. There's a couple other I'll mention. And as I mentioned, there's like a, just such a big bucket of, of good hormones you can get with sleep. Um, I would say uh, the next I would talk about would be leptin. Um, leptin and ghrelin, actually. They're kind of little buddies here. But leptin is a hormone that should make us feel um, really satiated and full after we eat. And then ghrelin, on the other hand, I always think of it like a little gremlin. Um, Ghrelin's going to increase and make you like this hungry, hungry hippo where you're just hungry all the time, right? And when you have chronic sleep um, issues and you're not sleeping well, it looks like ghrelin increases. So you're hungrier, you know, constantly, even after you eat. And then there seems to be this issue with leptin resistance where we were resisting the hormone that should make us feel um, full and, and like we're done eating. So that can really um, be balanced too with, with appropriate sleep amounts. So. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think that people can go without sleep for a little bit of time, but it's going to catch up with them. Cause I know there are people who say, Oh, well, I don't need to sleep. I only need a few hours. And there, there are those rare people that don't need a lot of sleep. And I think as we get older, we need less and less sleep as the kids need more sleep and you know, young adults, you know, a little, and then as we get older, it seems like we don't need quite as much but I, what I do find is that those people, most of the people that are bragging, oh, I don't need much sleep, eventually it catches up to them and they, you know, they do develop health issues because it's, it's hard to replace what you get from sleep with something else, like doing injections or taking a hormone or taking supplements. To a certain extent, it can kind of fill in the gaps to help support our bodies through times of stress but I don't think that people should rely upon that either. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are instances where people can do that. It, it's always a matter of time, though. It really is uh, to where they're going to run up against health issues, you know. And so, again, I think um, you, you get away with it until you just 
don't, you know, is the bottom line and you really have to kind of step back and reassess. So, um, you know, for, for those people, I would say great, you know, like do what you're doing right now, but do remember there may be a point where you do have to kind of reassess that and, and be okay with that, you know? So. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So what else, what other things that we need to think about in terms of boosting our energy? Yeah, so next I wanted to bring up um, using food as fuel. So um, first off, part of that is hydration. So hydration is easily um, overlooked. And, and the first sign of even minimal dehydration is fatigue. So that's one that can easily be adjusted. And, and it's really usually just a habit of, of trying to drink more water. Um, so that's part of that section. But there's also um, the issue of choosing what I call kindling or choosing big fat logs to kind of fuel your fire. Um, so if you think about um, all of the different types of foods we have available to us, it, we can put them into the kind of box of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Um, as a whole, I think we are, we tend um, to be a little bit heavier in that carbohydrate load or that what I call kindling. So if you imagine that fire, if you're feeding, you know, mostly carbohydrates all throughout the day, it's a great fuel source. It's going to give you some energy, but it's going to burn up really quickly and really, uh, yeah, just right, right away. And so if you can move the spectrum, the dial a little bit more towards heavier in the protein and fats, that can give you uh, like a big log where you have a little bit more stable energy. You don't have to be feeding the fire as often. And you um, get away from this, this cycle of carbohydrate increase with insulin levels and kind of this roller coaster up and down of your hormone levels, which can also be really exhausting for the body to kind of constantly be um, keeping up with. So, um, so that's another, another um, thing to think about when you're thinking about your energy levels. Um, and so then what are some of the ideal foods then that are more like, you know, a nice big log that's going to keep you going rather than just yeah. that's going to get, get you a little energy boost. Yeah. So, um, you want to think about, like I said, proteins, fats, and, and fiber too, actually we could add into this. So, um, you know, a salad, maybe adding some protein to that, whether that's chicken or even, um, lentils or beans that can, that can provide a lot of fiber, um, and a good amount of protein, um, fats. You want to think about avocados are usually the first thing that comes to my mind. Most people really enjoy the taste of those and they are really nice, healthy fat. Um, things like olive oil can be also very help, helpful. Um, avoiding, I think, the things that are more um, kindling-like. Those would be the quick, um, usually like granola bars or, uh, you know, chocolate-laden things. Um, things like um, melons, um, watermelon or mangoes tend to be pretty um, quick kindling, um, as opposed to if you compare them to those kind of heavier um, fats and proteins like meats and avocado and beans, perhaps. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, now, are there certain types of fruits that you would recommend instead of those? Or do you think that fruit in general is not as um, much of a good energy source? Yeah, I mean, I think depending on the person, fruit is a wonderful energy source, but if you do consider a, along the whole spectrum, there are fruits that tend to kind of spike the blood sugar faster, like I mentioned, the, the melons tend to do that. Um, on the other side, the fruits that have like a, a, a rind around them, a peel, um, excuse me, a peel would be like pears and apples, they tend to be a little bit slower to absorb less of that insulin and sugar spike. Um, berries are also really great for that uh, low kind of uh, spike in glucose. Okay. All right. Great. So food, of course, we always want to talk about food. And I think that in general, people know are the, the foods that really boost energy and the ones that bring us down. And um, I think too, that it, I mean, it seems to me that if there are certain foods that people have a hard time digesting, then that's going to use up some of the energy, right? So those aren't going to be... Yeah. That's good. Yeah, That's absolutely. Nice. Yeah, digestion takes an incredible amount of energy. I think it's it's pretty amazing if we think about it, you know, turning, uh, say, an apple into 
skin cells or hair like that's a pretty incredible thing that our body does and it actually it takes quite a lot of energy right it doesn't just happen um, in a quick second but it's it's this incredible transformation and so we have to really um, you know let our digestive system know right that that um, we we understand that and and um, which kind of leads to the next point that I was going to talk about is um, intermittent fasting. So that can be a really effective way to increase energy levels, actually, because, um, well, I should mention kind of what intermittent fasting is um, first, if, there's, if those of you haven't heard of it, but it's, it's really using um, a prolonged state throughout the day of staying away from food. And so there's a lot of research to show that um, like 12 hours of eating, we call that 12 hours on, and then staying away from food 12 hours in any given day can really help to um, decrease insulin resistance and help the digestive system repair because it's getting time away from doing that really heavy duty work that it's responsible for. Um, so 12 and 12 is, is oftentimes you'll hear about that type of eating style and there's even um, eating within an eight hour window and um, leaving 16 hours away from food seems to be even better at decreasing that, that insulin resistance, that hormone that um, we run into so many issues with. And you're not talking about eating 12 hours straight. <laughs> Just right. No. Sure eating. We're clear from that. Obviously, it's 12 hours and you're fasting. It's 12 hours of not eating. But then you don't change over to 12 hours of just constant eating. <laughs> yeah, no, just sticking within that window, like, yeah, finishing eating, you know, 12 yeah. hours, at least 12 just hours. Having yeah. 12 hours of the day where you are eating during that time and then 12 yeah. hours that you're strictly avoiding food. That's what sure. we're talking about. Now, during the 12 hours of eating, <laughs> um, what, what do you recommend as far as spacing out during that time? Yeah, um, it looks like, you know, eating, sticking to meals that are two or three times a day is actually showing in the research to be more effective now than this kind of constant snacking that we were all told to do for, you know, uh, quite a few years now. I think that was a fairly great disservice to our metabolic, um, you know, systems where, the, the body was getting food, you know, almost constantly throughout the day, sometimes like three meals a day and three snacks sometimes we're taught. And, and the idea was to give your body constant fuel. Um, but what we're also realizing is that it's just that massive amount of energy that the body has to expend, um, you know, just constantly doing that can really suck the, the energy levels from people. And so um, people that have an issue, you know, with lower blood sugar levels might not be able to overnight go into, you know, just eating two or three meals a day. Um, so I like to put that caution out there, but, you know, the idea is to move towards that so that um, there, there's more rest for the digestive system. Right. And and so I noticed that sometimes when I eat, uh, I'm really tired afterwards. Yeah. And, and, I, and I know that uh, it, to me, then I'll go, oh my gosh, what did I eat? Because obviously my body is struggling with this. But I think that there also is this misconception out there in the, in the world, like, you know, like, you know, like a siesta, like you take an afternoon nap because you just ate, you ate a big meal. Right. So it's to be expected. Um, but I, I think it's a good also, I mean, yes, if you do eat a big meal every now and then, and you know, you're tired afterwards, yeah, that makes sense. But it also could be a sign that something that you just ate isn't particularly good for your body. So that's what I do when I notice that I'm tired after eating. I'm like, okay, I didn't just fuel my body. I just dragged it down. Yeah. So I need yeah. to mm -hmm. It's a great point that you bring up. I think so many of us are used to, oh yeah, that's just a normal, you know, a normal feeling after a meal. And quite honestly, it's, it's the opposite is true. We should feel energized from eating. That's, that's what our body, uh, you know, the whole purpose of eating. And so when we feel sluggish, it's a really good sign that something's amiss. Maybe it's, um, you know, the digestive system is not quite working as it, as it could be, or that the food choice that was made is just not the right for your body, right one for your body at this time. Um, so great point. Like for one, one for me that is just so random is peanut butter. I, I don't think that my body likes peanut butter because when I have it, 
I get tired afterwards. So yeah. I, my body's just like, whoa, what's going on here? Is slowing right. everything down because it's trying to digest it. If I eat a little bit of peanuts in something, it's not not the same kind of egg, but peanut butter. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where people are like, oh, you was probably because you had too much sugar. I'm like, no, actually, something. Yeah. You know, it just my body can't digest it very well. Yeah, and everyone's different, you know, and that's where we have to really get um, artistic about the way we recommend dietary um, approaches because, I mean, really, at one person is not the same as the next, you know, so we have to check in with every single, every single body and, and look for signs like that, like you were mentioning, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, well, great, and the, but there are other th ways that we can fuel the body, and, and part of that is addressing the root cause, right? I mean, like, you know, so, so what are some of the, 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 the root causes that are things that we can then address to help boost energy? Yeah, yeah, great question. So another thing I wanted to bring up um, are the mitochondria of the body. If you guys remember from like eighth grade science, these are the little organelles that sit inside every single cell and they if you think about maybe that like the actual physical location of energy in the body it this is where it's at the mitochondria literally create electricity for us or, or ATP that's the energy that are that's the currency of energy in our body um, so we have to make sure we're feeding the mitochondria the things that it wants to eat so, so that they can do the, the work that we so want them to do um, and so when we break down, like, hey, what are these little mitochondria running on? Um, we can break it down into a few different things, one of which is oxygen. So, you know, you hear recommendations to use deep breathing and that can kind of calm the nervous system, and which is all true. But literally what we're doing is driving more oxygen to these little organelles, which are eating it up and turning uh, this whole system to create energy. And then on the, the hormone realm, um, thyroid hormone, super important for every cell in the body, but very important for these mitochondria. They love to, to eat up this thyroid hormone and use it. We think of it almost like the gas pedal for the whole system. You want, you know, you can have all of the other kind of mitochondrial um, uh, nutrients in place, but if you don't have gas on that gas pedal, you, you know, the car is not going to go anywhere. So we want to make sure we have enough, you know, to move the car forward. We also don't want to be um, having the, the pedal to the metal, right? And, and that's what we call hyperthyroidism, where we're also going to become tired at the end of the day from that too, but we have to have this nice balance um, there. Um, the mitochondria are also going to use that fuel that we fed, right? It's either kindling or it's those big logs that we're feeding it. So it's going to use that. It's also going to use a lot of vitamins and nutrients. Um, I could, you know, spend two hours listing them all out. So I'll save you all from that. However, do realize that eating a whole foods diet, you know, food that uh, grew from the ground or animal products, these are um, the nutrient building blocks. This provides everything that these mitochondria need. So you don't have to study every single one of them and, and get them in your body in a supplement form. You can get that through your food. And I think that's the easiest way to do that. The easiest way to make sure those mitochondria are super, super happy um, so that you have energy, you know, to fuel your dreams. What, so I know, and I know there are a lot of nutrients involved at the mitochondria function, but what are, what would you say are a couple of the really important ones? Yeah, um, the B vitamins, uh, those are often known for being quite energizing to the body. And that's the very reason why is because they're really intertwined with um, the mitochondria. They, they love to eat B vitamins. And so as much as we can feed them B vitamins, that's going to be really good. Uh, fruits and vegetables basically are when you where you're going to get those. There are people that we feel like mm, their digestion, maybe we're working on that. It's not quite up to par. And you can use supplements to kind of, you know, um, fill the gaps of that. And those can be quite energy, uh, energizing for that reason. Um, and then CoQ10 is another vitamin that you've probably heard of, and, and that drives and feeds the mitochondria as well. Okay, great. So, in the, but there are certain B vitamins you can't get from fruits and vegetables, right? 
Yeah, so um, B12 is a, a big one. And that, um, if you remember back from like kind of the, the pre, the testing that we do right off the bat, I always look at people's B12 levels along with their iron levels because those nutrients are really hard to extract um, from fruits and vegetables alone. You definitely need protein sources and animal sources are the easiest way to get B12. So for uh, vegetarians and vegans out there, um, a lot of them kind of understand that and they're supplementing with the B12, um, but that part's really important to consider. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Just always wanna remind people that we, want, yeah. we need to get nutrients in different places. And then sometimes, our body needs some extra support with, with supplements, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people are dealing with digestive issues and as you're kind of working with a practitioner to help um, get that back to where it should be, you know, supplements definitely can be a really nice therapy to bridge the gap, you know, in the meantime and still, um, still have your body thriving as you're healing it. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. And then some of the, the nutrients that you talked about, like the B vitamins, they're also good for addressing uh, adrenal issues, which is another big thing yeah. that causes us to be tired, right? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely can't, um, you know, glaze over adrenal fatigue. I think it's such a, uh, you know, pervasive issue for a lot of people. And you're right, um, B vitamins, especially B5 and B6, the adrenals love, um, and that can really help support um, people that are in adrenal fatigue. But, you know, what we're really talking about there are um, cortisol levels that are not optimal. The adrenal glands, they're these cute little glands that sit on top of the kidneys, and, and they produce cortisol. Cortisol is known kind of as our stress hormone. And I always bring up this, this Goldilocks story for patients to understand this is that, you know, we want some cortisol, we don't want too much, and we also don't want too little. Most people assume that they have just, you know, skyrocketing high levels of cortisol. It's probably true maybe when they were younger, um, but most adults I find have low or suboptimal cortisol levels across the board. I'd say nine out of 10. Um, and so really our job is how do we tell the adrenals that you know everything's okay, that they're, the chronic stress is, um, is lowering, that we're getting appropriate levels of sleep. Maybe we can supplement with B5 and B6. Uh, they also love vitamin C. And then there's this whole host of um, botanicals called the adaptogenic botanicals, and they help the body to adapt to stress over time. So that's their name. And um, there's, there's a ton of them. My favorite is holy basil. So um, that's one that you can remember. But yeah, absolutely a key part of feeling um, fatigued is, is often this underlying kind of low cortisol level. Right. Um, I, and I know that one thing that that you talk about a lot and that I find really helpful for boosting energy is exercise, moving your body. Uh, so t explain why exercise is, is important for boosting energy. Yeah. So, um, so many reasons. I think one of the first ones is, is delivering, it's all about delivering oxygen to every cell in the body. Remember that mitochondria, they need oxygen to, to do their whole job to create the energy that we want so much of. So if we are um, constantly, you know, sitting all day long, or we have a poor posture, we're not you know, using deep breathing, we're not moving our bodies, the mitochondria are just kind of like, they don't have a lot of oxygen to, to do their job. Um, and so we can get creative about this. It doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, a 60 minutes of intense exercise. We can, we can get creative about how we move our body. And it's why I choose to use that phrase instead of exercise for a lot of people, because I think they get, um, they're already so tired. They feel so absolutely overwhelmed if, if I say the, the E word, right? And so if we put it into this term, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can do that. There's standing desks that we can use while we're at work. There's like those kneeling chairs um, now that are available. You can take just quick walks. You can just stand up and down, even if you can't do anything else, that alone, doing some stretching, again, moving your body, not necessarily, you know, needing to do um, HIIT workouts or, or Orange Theory. Some people aren't great candidates for that, but, um, 
you know, another aspect I think to the, the hormone realm is, is this insulin resistance that a lot of times we have so many people dealing with. Um, and it does look like moving your body and using resistance type exercises can decrease um, that insulin resistance too. So that's just, you know, one other, one other reason to use it. But yeah, probably the best medicine out there besides a good night's sleep, I think. Yeah. And, and of course, more is not always better, right? Just because right. a little bit of exercise is good doesn't mean that you're, if you um, exercise all day long, that it's necessarily going to be, or run marathons, that it's going to yeah. help with your energy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I think, you know, the, the patients that are dealing with really severe adrenal fatigue or um, have hypothyroidism, maybe Hashimoto's, which is the autoimmune reason for having low thyroid. Um, and sometimes they, they get into little flares um, where, where they're really, really fatigued. And it's actually not a great thing to be um, really pushing through some type of a heavy workout, right? And like you said, working out for too long or too intensely. Um, because remember that we just don't have, we don't have thyroid hormone. We don't have the gas pedal. So we're just pushing our body through and there can, you know, create quite a bit of inflammation. Um, and it's just not the overall ideal, uh, best way to go about it. It can really deplete them even more. Right. So with exercise, I was thinking, um, you know, I, like I mentioned, I have a puppy and <laughs> that's one of the other things that I've noticed. It's forced me, she, having her, it's forced me to go out and go for walks with her, which isn't necessarily something but you know, that I was always just on my own going to go, oh, you know what? I need to take a break and go for a walk. But yeah. um, because I, I don't want her to go to the bathroom in the house. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I have to get outside. And I've noticed I, it's so nice now to every few hours to go outside and enjoy the fresh air and the sunlight and some movement. And, and also she makes me laugh too. Right. So yes. all those kinds of things. Um, and I think everybody should go out and get a puppy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I completely agree. I, yeah, I have, um, a little puppy too. And it's just like the best reminder of what's important in life. And, you know, and, and just being playful and getting outside, you know, it's, it's just like, you can't learn better things than, than from your pet. <laughs> right. I'm kidding. Everybody, I know that not everybody can go out and get a puppy, <laughs> but it, for me, it's been great. Um, and it, yeah. it's funny because it touches on a lot of the things that you're talking about. Right. Um, so this has been absolutely fantastic. And it, you know, just kind of as a recap, because I know we covered a lot is that I think when you say that getting to the root cause, having someone to help you figure that out, and then supporting the body with, with, with the foundation of, the, mm -hmm. of good sleep and fitness and, and good food, those sorts of things, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we all know this stuff. We know, you know, we've heard so many times, I, I know I should be sleeping and eating well, but kind of breaking it down and explaining why I think is so helpful for people. So they, they have really um, good information to, to be uh, motivated from, right? And, and to really understand the reason behind those recommendations. They're not just like shoulda, coulda, woulda. They're, they're, there's legit physiologic reasons that this can really be helpful for you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Dr. Laura, will you tell everybody where they can find you? You're, you're seeing patients. And so you tell everybody where, where you are and, and your website. Sure. Yeah. So the best place to find out what I'm doing and what's going on is at my, um, my main website and that's drneville.com. And it's, it's actually doctor spelled out and then N-E-V-I-L-L-E.com. Um, my social media links are also there, so you can find me there. I'm pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and for those of you listening, if you head to that website, you can actually download a free PDF, um, provides five um, hormone balancing and energy boosting recipes for you delivered straight to your inbox. Um, my intention with this is to really make sure that um, your energy levels are such that you can fuel your dreams. That's the whole point of all of this. And so we can do that pretty easily with some nice uh, nutritional therapies. So you'll find them at my website. Great. Thank you. And I've seen those recipes. They look great. Um, it's always nice to be able to, to have energy boosting foods and recipes that taste great too. So we can get yeah. the best of both worlds of enjoying exactly. it. Well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Laura, thank you so much for joining us and, um, and we'll stay in touch and everybody go check out our website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Laura Neville and got some great tips on boosting your energy. It's really about addressing the root causes behind your health issues, building a solid foundation for health to help you have that zest for life that you deserve. So to learn more about Dr. Neville, you can go to thespadoctor.com, go to the podcast page with their interview, and you'll find all the information about her there. And while you're there at thespotdoctor.com, I invite you to join the community so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't taken the skin quiz yet, you could go to theskinquiz.com. It's a free online tool to help you understand what messages your skin might be trying to tell you about your health and what you could do about it. Just go to theskinquiz.com. Also, I invite you to join me on social media. The Spa Doctor is all over the place. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest. We're all over the place. So just join us there and join the conversation. And I'll see you next time on the Spot Actor Podcast.